Let me now introduce Dr. Sharon Collard, who is our next speaker for today's conference. Dr. Sharon is Research Director at the University of Bristol in the UK. Do financial services have a role in helping reduce harms from gambling? This presentation will explore the potential role of financial services in helping reduce harms from gambling, drawing on research conducted in Britain with the financial services sector and people who have experience of gambling and gambling harms. Dr. Collard, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So I, um, as, as has already been introduced, I'm going to talk about the role of financial services in helping reduce the harms from gambling. So, so to start straight away by saying um, that clearly financial services may have a role to play, um, but there are many other actors involved as well, most importantly, gambling operators and regulators. So we are definitely not saying that um, financial services um, uh, it, it's acting um, uh, in a way that's contrary to other actors, and what we're seeing, what we're saying is that can financial services um, help reduce gambling harms in a way that is complementary to the primary work that is carried out by gambling operators and gambling regulators. So uh, this is based on um, research that was done that we have done in Britain um, that was published last year. Um, and I'm going to focus today on the work that we've done around um, gambling blocks that financial services can offer their customers in order to help them control their gambling spend. First of all, I just wanted to think about five reasons why financial services um, have a role to play in helping reduce the gambling harm, and in particular, the financial harm from gambling. Firstly, they have a significant reach into our population. So almost all UK adults have a debit card and many of us are connected to the financial services sector in other ways as well. That means that financial services firms and particularly banks have a unique window into our financial situations that can help them to see where there may be risk of gambling harm uh, and potentially to intervene to help prevent that. Thirdly, but linked to that, financial services firms can offer tools to help customers manage their gambling spend. Um, and fourthly, in the UK, there has been a much stronger regulatory focus on the fair treatment of vulnerable customers in the past five years or so. And that includes customers who might be at risk of gambling related vulnerability. And indeed, some of our more recent work has looked at that. And finally, I think there's a business case for financial services to have a role. In 2016, 2017, there was um, around three and a half, uh, sorry, 350 million pounds of reported fraud was linked uh, to gambling. Um, gambling related misconduct is potentially an issue among financial services employees. But also there's demand, I think, from customers as um, firms offer things like gambling blocks. Customers uh, expect financial services firms to be doing more to stop financial related harm happening from gambling. So at the moment, we have 10 UK firms that offer debit card gambling blocks, and these are essentially a feature um, within an app or a mobile banking um, uh, app, uh, mobile banking functionality, um, which enables the customer to um, voluntarily put on a, a, a spending block. And once they've activated that spending block, what it means is that they will not be able to use that particular card um, to, to pay for gambling. Most of them, as, as I say, are app-based app or mobile phone-based. Um, but, but, but there are also opportunities for people to switch on um, uh, gambling blocks with some firms, for example, um, to, do, to be able to do that within the branch. So the research that we've done around this is, is looking really at what makes for an effective um, card control. Uh, when we started this work back in 2019, there was very little evidence about what worked in terms of bank card gambling blocks and who was who, who they might work for. So what we have done is used um, 
uh, new research to produce a blueprint for card controls where we're really aiming to balance commercial realism for banks and other financial services firms with consumer-centered friction and intervention. And the research that we've done, we have carried out is based on insights from people with lived experience through surveys and interviews. We've also um, analyzed aggregated data and statistical insights that was provided by banks um, and other firms on customer use of gambling blocks. And we've had discussions with treatment providers, um, financial services firms and regulatory bodies. And so it is an evidence-based blueprint that we have produced. Just to give a kind of summary of our findings, there were five main things that we felt were important, um, which I'll talk through briefly um, in the rest of my presentation. The first one was around availability and the fact that actually we think that because the technology works on bank card gambling blocks, they should be available to all card users. The blocks do seem to work in terms of their technical effectiveness. They seem to block almost all gambling transactions, although there were some examples of something called transaction laundering, which is where um, it's not possible to track the trans traction, transaction back to a gambling operator. But those were quite, um, um, quite unusual at the time when we did the research. In terms of their technical effectiveness, the blockers did seem to be helpful in controlling uh, people's gambling spend and helping people to stop gambling. Um, for example, we, we conducted an online survey with people who've been in touch with gambling treatment and support services, and 30% of those respondents had activated a card blocker, and over half of those uh, respondents who had activated a card blocker had since spent less or no money at all on gambling. And similarly, data from a bank that, that engaged in the research suggested that um, block users um, ha, ha, had turned on the block um, and, and not gambled subsequently, which is very positive. And so what we would like to see is um, bank card uh, blocks as a standard feature, because when we were doing the research, as many as 28 million personal current accounts and 35 million credit cards may not have offered blocks. And that was a lot of potential um, help and support that wasn't available to those customers. So once um, firms are um, making blocks available as standard, the other thing that's really important is around raising awareness about those blocks. Um, we found in our survey that only, um, you know, awareness was quite low, nearly half of our survey participants were not aware of them, and that was a group of people who would have benefited from them. We felt that edu um, gambling education, treatment and peer support services have a really important role to play in raising consumer awareness alongside other tools um, uh, and, and help that might be available. And the information about the um, bank card blocks needs to be easy to understand and transparent in terms of, you know, if somebody uses a bank card block, how is the data that's generated from that going to be used by the bank um, and providing some reassurance um, about that. So the third um, thing that was really important that we found from our research is about the design of the blocks themselves. And what we would suggest from the findings that, we, um, that we've um, uh, published is that every debit card blocker should be built around a time release lock. Um, so what does that mean in practice? Well, at the time of the research, over a third of the bank card blockers that were in existence could be literally toggled on and off like a light switch. So if somebody, a customer, um, wanted to put the block on, they could do so, but they could just as easily switch it off. Um, and now what we've seen is that it evolved over time. So nearly, um, so nine of the 10 firms that have blocks actually have a time release block, um, a time release lock in place. So what that means in practice is that if somebody has put um, a gambling block on their debit card and they decide to take it off, they can take it off, but they will have to wait for a period of time, normally between 48 and 72 hours. So it basically gives a cooling off period in which they can um, think about um, whether they actually want to remove the block 
um, or if they want to, to keep it on. And it's the idea that, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, um, it gives somebody pause for thought before they turn the block off. And that's important because what um, banks were seeing in their own data analysis was potentially higher toggling, so this switching on and off, and higher gambling spend where there was no time release lock um, in place. Our research with people with lived experience also indicates the importance of choice. So nearly 60% of our survey participants thought a time release lock should be 48 hours or more. And in fact, um, nine of the 10 firms um, do have a lock of that duration now. And that has evolved a little bit over time. But also over 80% of our survey participants supported banks offering the option of a permanent block. Um, and that's not something that is available at the moment. So moving on to um, thinking about what else can reinforce the positive impact of um, debit card uh, blockers. Well, the fourth thing was around um, actually having a complementary feature, which would be to limit cash withdrawals. Um, and actually having that as a standard feature alongside bank card gambling blocks. Why is that important? Well, evidence from one bank that took part in our research suggested that around 15% of its gambling block users had found a workaround to their gambling block. Um, while they couldn't say for certain that that was always cash, cash did seem like an obvious um, candidate for that workaround uh, by going to an ATM, taking cash out and spending it um, on gambling. Now, it is the case at the moment that most UK banks will, if they're asked by the customer, place a monthly or a daily limit on um, the cash withdrawals that you can make from a cash machine. But we really feel that, that actually a stronger connection needs to be made between firms, the financial services firms, between the cash limits um, and the card blockers so that the two can almost go hand in hand for people who really want to try and um, control or completely stop. Um, gambling. And it's also important in terms of helping customers to make that connection too. So it's not just about what's going on on your debit card, it's also about um, having access to cash. And the final finding really goes um, beyond um, debit cards themselves and thinking about, you know, the payments um, system is rapidly evolving. There are lots and lots of new payment methods. Um, around that can that mean that people may move away from using uh, debit cards um, to gamble and spend in other ways. And so I think it's really important that, that things evolve alongside, alongside the payment system. So what we've seen is what we would like to see is e-wallet providers um, offering their own gambling blocks. Now in Britain since April 2020, gambling operators um, should only take an e-wallet payment um, where it hasn't come from a credit card because gambling on credit cards has been banned. However, debit card deposits are still permitted, meaning they remain a possible workaround because somebody can, while somebody can't gamble directly using their debit card, they can use their debit card um, to fund an e-wallet and gamble in that way. So we felt that there was really um, a, a good opportunity here for e-wallet providers to do the same as the debit card providers and, and provide a, a block, which would be a time release block as well. Um, and that would build on changes that they already had made in response to the Gambling Commission's um, credit card ban in Britain. So it would seem like a natural evolution. And finally, there's also the role of credit reference agencies. These are um, in the UK, these are commercial agencies. We have um, a, a, a fairly significant number of them um, which, which hold and manage our credit files. And there is an opportunity there for credit reference agencies to play a, a role in terms of helping people to opt out of credit if they don't um, want to be lent to uh, because they're worried about gambling with the money. Um, and that could be by using something called a notice of correction on their personal credit record, um, which, which gives extra information about their situation, um, such as that they do not want to be lent to because um, they're worried about um, spending that money on gambling. And um, some of the credit reference agencies do have information on their websites um, about using a notice of correction 
where somebody is worried about their gambling. So that is um, one step forward, but we feel there's much more that could be done to make it easy and straightforward for people to do that. And again, to raise awareness that that's an option for people. So that's um, a very uh, brief overview about the work we've been doing on bank card gambling blocks in Britain. Um, and a reminder of the kind of the five key things um, that we found from the research which ultimately um, takes us beyond um, banks and, and debit cards into new forms of payment and thinking about the other actors in the financial ecosystem, such as credit reference agencies. Um, so the report is publicly available to download from our website. Um, and and um, if you have any questions, um, please do get in touch. I'd be very happy to um, take any questions um, offline, obviously. Um, yeah, and if download you want to from our website. Um, 